Hello, fellow birders. My name is Dennis Kania. Today we're going to be taking a closer look at some common species you might find in your backyard or around parks that might confuse you a bit when you see them in juvenile plumage. On the DuPage Birding Club Education Channel, we'll be discussing all things bird related. And as I mentioned, today we'll be taking a closer look at some confusing backyard juveniles. So let's start off pretty easily. Um, I think everyone would recognize an American robin if they see one. And it's a bird that is quite common in our backyards. And you probably have noticed very similar looking birds that have a lot of speckling on them. And those just happen to be juveniles of the same species. So some of the defining features that are present uh, would be things such as the bill shape and that head pattern is consistent with both adult and juveniles. And the overall coloration is pretty much the same. Where the confusion comes into play is when we see all these dark spots across the breast and we see some spotting on the back. But this is why it's important to look at structural features and some overall coloration. And so we shouldn't be taking all the birds in our backyard for granted. And um, you know, upon closer investigation, you'll see that you know, there are a lot of similarities between these two plumages. It also helps to pay attention to what birds are hanging around together. And so if you see that an adult robin is coming over and attending to this strangely plumaged bird, then you can probably have a pretty good idea that that's going to be an American robin juvenile. So to take that one step further, we're now out in a, uh, a parkland setting probably. Uh, you're not as likely to find this species in your backyard unless you're a very lucky person. We have Eastern bluebirds. And again, if you look at the overall structure of these two birds, you'll see that they're very, very similar. The bill shape is very similar. The um, head shape, the overall structure of the body, all very, very similar. So those are some of the uh, defining features. And we're used to seeing these bluebirds with a lot of bright blue on them. Well, in the case of the juvenile, you're missing almost all of that blue. You do have some in the wing, you do have some in the tail but the overall color of this bird is going to be grayish. You will again find spots across the breast and you'll find some speckling on the back, which are quite different than what we see on the Eastern bluebird adult. But again, you'll probably find these birds foraging together or you'll find the adult actually coming to the, this unusually plumaged bird and, and attending to it. So um, that would be a huge clue once again. So now things get a little more confusing. Uh, here we have brown-headed cowbird, and you can see on the left what the adult male and female look like. The adult male is in the foreground, and that's quite a bit different than this bird that we're seeing on the right. Uh, there are hardly any comparisons to be made at all between these two. The best you could probably do is to look at the, uh, the bill structure, and you can see that that bill shape is pretty much the same. It's strong, strong um, at the base, it's very wide. And it comes to a, a point, but it's uh, a short bill, so it looks rather um, stout. So that would be the main thing that you'd be able to maybe um, you know, draw a comparison. What confuses all of this is that um, you, you do have this large juvenile bird possibly being fed by a very small adult. And that should actually be a major clue. Uh, for those of you that don't, know this, it's uh, the brown-headed cowbird is a parasite, a nest parasite, and so it'll lay its eggs in the nest of other birds. And quite often it's picking small songbirds like warblers or sparrows, which are all going to be smaller um, than this juvenile. So that should be a big tip off right off the bat when you see this larger bird being attended to by, by little um, warblers or sparrows. But I just saw one recently at St. James Farm and uh, that one was being attended to by chipping sparrows. So the size difference was quite dramatic. You'll also notice on this juvenile that there's a lot of speckling on the breast and you'll see that there's a very clean looking scalloping effect going on on the back and that's because all the back feathers are edged in this kind of a pale buff, almost whitish, and it's very uniform, very neat uh, edges to all of those feathers. And so it does create that very interesting scalloped look on the back. So this one might be a little more confusing than some of our other juveniles. 
And speaking of chipping sparrow, here is chipping sparrow. And you can see between the adult and the juvenile plumage, you can see that the overall patterning on the head is very much the same. The coloration's a little bit different. You can see that there's a lot of rufous in the crown of the adult on the left, but the juvenile on the right is um, a very dark crown. And you can see that the median crown stripe goes pretty far up through the crown, whereas on an adult chipping sparrow, that median crown stripe is going to be confined to just the forecrown. And after that point, you don't see that uh, median crown stripe any longer. So again, facial pattern is very much the same. What gets confusing is the fact that this bird has so much heavy and well-defined streaking on the breast. But in all other characteristics, it looks very, very much like a chipping sparrow. And you will see probably these birds hanging around together in this you know, group on the ground foraging. So your big clue would be that it's hanging around with uh, what you commonly would recognize as chipping sparrows. Here's uh, cedar waxwings. And of course, it has a very unique uh, profile. It has an interesting bill shape, uh, quite different than most of our other passerines. It does have a bit of a crest, and I think everyone would easily recognize cedar waxwing in its adult plumage. What throws people off, even though that head pattern is, is very much the same and it still looks slightly crested, is the fact that the overall color of this bird is very grayish brown. And you don't see any of these warm yellow or buffy tones that you see in the adult. Everything looks just very drab on this species or on this individual. And you can see that um, there's a lot of streaking on the breast. Uh, there's even some streaking on the back. It's very diffused streaking, but it's there nonetheless. And it's quite different looking then because of that. But one of the telltale characteristics of cedar waxwing is carried over to the uh, juvenile. And that's the terminal band of yellow on the uh, tail. And you can see that clearly on the adult bird, and you can see that on the juvenile as well right here. So that would be a huge clue that you're looking at cedar waxwing. Uh, here we have red-bellied woodpecker, and this is an easily identified uh, adult species. It has that very, very bold black and white patterning on the back, and that does carry over to the juvenile plumage, which is on the right. Where there might be some confusion with this particular species is the fact that um, the adults are always going to have all of that red on the crown and on the nape, and that is almost non-existent on the juvenile. And the fact that that red is so conspicuous and it easily draws um, our eye, you'd, um, you'd be surprised when you see that, that lacking in the juvenile. So, so that would be what would, might throw people off when they just don't see that red there. So, so keep that in, in mind. And again, you'll probably find you know, that this young bird is being attended to by, by adults. So here we have an occipiter, the Cooper's hawk. So it's a, it's a unique hawk um, in our area in terms of we don't have occipiters around all the time. And those are more of forest dwelling species as opposed to things like red-tailed hawks, which are gonna be out in open areas. And so structurally they're put together quite different. And um, nowadays the Cooper's hawk is actually readily found in our urban environments. Uh, it was a bird that was uh, actually its populations were diminishing considerably. But now it's found a way to make a living in our urban environment by feeding off of our bird feeders. And so it's making a huge comeback. And when we see the adult, you can see that it has a very grayish back here and you can see it has barring across the upper breast and it's very rufous in color. It does have the longish tail and it does have a rounded corners on the, uh, it's a terminal end of the tail. You're going to see all those uh, structural features pretty much the same in the juvenile bird. The back will not be quite as gray, it'll be more brownish. But where the real difference comes into play is the, the breast. You can see that instead of having the roof is barring across the breast, we have this very, very strong brown streaking, very, very bold. And so that makes this bird overall look quite different. But it is the bird to be expected in our, um, in our subdivisions especially during the breeding season. When we get into the fall, it, there might be a, an added level of confusion here because all of a sudden we'll start having sharp-shinned hawks around, which is a slightly smaller version of the same bird. In fact, it's close to overlapping in size because Cooper's hawks, females are quite large compared to the male counterpart, which is a little smaller. And 
as with all of our raptors, the females are larger than the males. So if we have a male Cooper's hawk and we're comparing that to a female sharp-shinned hawk, they won't actually overlap in size, but they'll be very close in size. So you have to take that into consideration in the spring and the fall. Now we'll have some other contenders out there. But for the most part, you'd be pretty safe to assume that you're looking at um, a juvenile Cooper's hawk. That's the bird that we would expect in our neighborhoods right now. So again, you can look, uh, if you want to make a separation between the uh, two species, the Coopers and the Sharpshin, you would always want to take a good look at that tail and see how it ends. And here you can see that it is quite rounded on the end. And you can see that there's a white terminal band and it's usually stronger on a Cooper's hawk than it would be on a Sharpshin. If we were looking at a Sharpshin hawk terminal tail end, you would see that the, um, the corners are very much squared off. So that's quite different. And Cooper's hawks tend to look larger headed than the uh, sharp-shinned hawk. So when you're looking at the bird, if it looks like the eye is bulging out of the head, it's because the head is kind of a smaller head and the eye just doesn't seem to fit um, proportionately to that, um, to that head. So that'd be another thing to look for when trying to separate Cooper's from sharp -shinned. But our main, our main objective here is to be able to separate the juvenile Cooper's from, from other hawks even though it looks so much different than, than the adult here, okay? So here we have a, a non-native species, but it is quite frequently found in parks and in our yards, and that's the European starling. And people are probably pretty familiar with seeing that bird, and they're used to seeing birds that look pretty much like this or something like this. And so all these little spots that are on the tips of all the body feathers and even in some of the uh, coverts and places like that, well, they're all gonna wear off through time during the breeding season, and you end up looking at a bird that's more like this. So you might find them somewhere in transition, so they might be a little bit spotted, they might have hardly any spots. And the same thing goes for the starling uh, juvenile. You can see the plumage overall is very, very pale gray compared to the adults, and so that would be the first thing that would be confusing about this. But this bird is already in transition, and you can see that there are some uh, adult feathers starting to come in, and you can see that those do have the spots on them, but you may not find them looking like that. But overall, the structure is very much the same, very short-tailed and short-winged, and the uh, bill shape is very much the same. And in this case here, we can see the juvenile has a black bill. And during the breeding season, we can see these have yellow bills, and those will transition to black as well. So if you're finding them somewhere in between um, overall breeding plumage and, and winter plumage, you may find some that are black billed and some that might be yellowish billed. But in any case, um, the structure is very, very much the same, even though the coloration might not be. And you'll see this group foraging together in the lawns uh, as a group quite frequently. They're very gregarious, so you're probably not going to find juvenile European starlings far away from a, a big flock of adults. So it'd be easy to make that uh, comparison and figure out that you are looking at juvenile uh, European starling. So keep in mind that juvenile birds in your yard are probably still being attended to by parents and that's usually a big clue. So you just have to wait long enough and see who comes to visit that bird. Uh, concentrate less on coloration and more on structure. Bill shape will be very useful in this regard. And narrow your list of candidates down to the species you expect to normally find in your yard or wherever you are birding. So don't think too much about you know, the rarities. Think about you know, what common bird does this most closely look like? And that's probably going to be your answer. So thanks for taking the time to view this video. Hopefully we've given you some bird food for thought. And I hope you'll join us again in the future as we explore all things bird related.